الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس قد جاءتكم موعظة من ربكم وشفاء لما في الصدور وهدى ورحمة للمؤمنين وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام My most respected elders, brothers and mothers and sisters that may be listening from home. When a person has something valuable and he recognizes the value of that precious item, then he will do his best to protect that item from being destroyed, from being stolen, from being plundered. We all recognize the value of money. And so we ensure that our money is kept in a safe place. Either it is kept in our pockets, in our wallets, if it's a small amount of money, or if it is a large amount of cash, then we keep it in a safe. And nowadays a person will keep his money stored electronically in the bank, and he has an encrypted password to get onto his online banking. Perhaps there may be different ways, biometric security features, two-factor authentication that allows him to get into his bank account because he recognizes the value of this wealth. If he leaves it out in the open, then it will be plundered, it will be stolen because somebody else recognizes the value of this wealth. Now in the same way, during the month of Ramadan, we have accumulated the wealth of a'mal, of good actions in our hearts. Just the mere act of fasting in the month of Ramadan, if a person does nothing else but simply the fasting, is such a great act of ibadat. The nur, the light of that a'mal, of those good deeds, penetrates deep into the recesses of a person's heart. But now the question is, after the month of Ramadan, how much of effort will we make to protect, to value, to safeguard this wealth that we have achieved during the Mubarak month of Ramadan. Unlike money, which has to be stored in a safe place because thieves will come in and steal it, this nur of a'mal that's sitting in our hearts, the thieves that will steal this will be the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after the month of Ramadan, we begin to destroy this nur of a'mal that we have accumulated in our hearts. And that is why we find that after a period of time, shortly after the month of Ramadan, our spirituality find it very difficult to carry out some of those good deeds which were extremely easy during the month of Ramadan. One aspect or one great act that we all carried out in the month of Ramadan which we need to preserve in the months going forward is our attachment, our devotion and our clinging on to the Mubarak Qur'an and Majid. Ramadan is known as Shahr al-Qur'an. It is known as the month of the Qur'an and during this month it is one of those great acts of worship which all of us have been involved in in some way or the other. At the minimum, we would have listened to the entire Quran in Majid being recited from cover to cover during Salat al Taraweeh. And over and above that, different people, according to their capacities, would recite the Quran as much as they could. But what we tend to find is that after the month of Ramadan, this attachment, this devotion to the Quran begins to wane for everybody. And of course, Ramadan has got its special virtues. It's not necessarily possible for us to always do in Ramadan what we do out of Ramadan because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left, has kept a certain amount of barakah in that Mubarak month. But our attachment to the Quran and Majid is something that we need to work on throughout the entire year. 
Nabi alayhi salam mentions that khayrukum man ta'allam al-Qur'an wa allama. The best of you. The best of you are not those who have the most amount of wealth. The best of you are not those who have the best homes. The best of you are not those who have the prettiest or the handsome, most handsome spouse. The best of you are not those with the most amount of qualifications. What does Nabi Ali Salam say? The best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach the Quran. And in another version of the hadith, the best of you are those who learn the Quran or teach the Quran. So there's only two things when it comes to our relationship with the Quran. Either we should be learning it or we should be teaching it. This is a great virtue. And often when we hear this hadith, we feel that it is restricted to the madaris, to the makatib, to the hifs classes. But Nabi Ali Salam has not restricted this hadith to those particular areas. It's arm, it's general for each and every one of us. Every one of us can become a student of the Quran. Every one of us can become a teacher of the Quran according to our capacities. It is mentioned that that person who is occupied completely with the Quran 24-7 and does not even have time to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of his needs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him more than what he gives to those people who are picking their hands up and in dua. The recitation of the Quran is one of the greatest acts of ibadat. It is the greatest form of dhikrullah. There's a hadith that comes in Sunan ibn Majah wherein Nabi Ali salam mentioned that inna lillahi ahlina minan nas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a household. He has family members from amongst the people. Sahaba radiallahu anhum were amazed. They said, Ya Rasulullah manhum, that oh Nabi of Allah, who are these special people that you are calling them the family of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now we all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above shape and form. He does not have a partner, he does not have children. So this is as befits the, magnet, uh, the, uh, the magnanimity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is an example. So who are these people that are called the family of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Nabi alayhi salam mentions, Hum ahlul Qur'an. These are the people of the Qur'an. Ahlullahi wa khassatu. That they are the family of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are his special bondsmen. They have a special relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the people who are not from Ahlul Qur'an, they do not enjoy that. So there is great virtue in the recitation and servicing the Qur'an throughout our lives. We find that many people, they complain that out of the month of Ramadan and even during the month of Ramadan, we don't have enough time to read as much Qur'an as we would like to read. We don't have enough time in the day. Now I invite each and every one of you, respected brothers and elders, do an audit of your daily schedule. Ascertain how you are spending your time. How much of our times gets how much of our time gets spent looking at screens? Nowadays your smartphone can give you a report on a weekly basis that you averaged on a daily basis over the last week seven hours of screen time. Those of you that get the report, sometimes it's staggering. We may not ponder and we may not sit back and think about it. But on average, people are spending seven, eight, nine hours a day on their screens. Seven, eight, nine and sometimes more hours a day on their screens. If we had to take out 30 minutes of that screen time only and allocate it throughout the entire day, how much of time we would be able to give to the Mubarak Qur'an in Majid. In fact, the Qur'an is such that the, the more the Qur'an will give back to you. There was a person who a few years ago, a non-Hafiz, complained that they were unable to even recite or they struggled to recite one juz of the Qur'an in Ramadan. One juz, one part of the Qur'an in the month of Ramadan. And they were upset about that fact. So they had some fikr, some con- concern, some worry in their heart. And they began to try to increase slowly, little by little, page by page, half a page by half a page. And as they began to increase their time with the Qur'an, they found that the ladhat, the enjoyment that they got, non-hafiz, does not understand the Qur'an-i-Majid, like most of us here. 
But as they began to increase, the more you give to the Qur'an, the more the Qur'an will give back to you. The more time you spend with the Qur'an, the more time you will want to spend with the Qur'an. The difference is we have to make the time for the Qur'an. So this person then began to spend little bit, little bit more time. Until they found in this Ramadan, and I'm narrating this to you as the person mentioned it to me, in this Ramadan they found that over and above all of their daily tasks, their chores, their work, their children, etc., this person was able to read four to five paras of the Qur'an comfortably, without any difficulty. So the more time we give to the Qur'an, the more the Qur'an will give back to us. So how do we move forward after the month of Ramadan, when it comes to the Qur'an? There are two aspects that we need to look at. And one is Qur'an at an individual level. You and I as individuals, what is our relationship with the Mubarak Qur'an in Jeet? And secondly, how can we bring Qur'an into the lives of our children and our families? Very important. That Qur'an must be in our lives, but not exclusively for us. Our homes must be environments of Qur'an. Our homes must be reverberating with the sound of Qur'an at different parts of the day or night. How do we bring that? So when it comes to an individual level, there's three aspects of the Qur'an, three relationships that we need to establish with the Mubarak Qur'an in Majid. The first is our recitation. The most important, without understanding even, is the recitation of the Qur'an, which is a separate virtue on its own. A person doesn't understand the Qur'an, but if he recites it, he will be getting great reward and barakah from the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now each of us has to understand and ascertain, what was my benchmark prior to this? How much of Qur'an was I able to recite daily, if anything? And let us be honest with ourselves, how many of us are there that don't pick up the Qur'an on a daily basis? Not even one line, not even one page. So the starting point is to understand, where was I yesterday and how can I improve on that? That person that is reciting no Qur'an, let us make that firm intention today. Let us make this niyat in this Mubarak Masjid that from today, we will recite a little bit of Qur'an every single day. Be it a few lines, be it half a page, be it one page of Qur'an, minimum at least one page. Our ulama mentioned that a non-hafiz should recite at least one para, one juz of the Qur'an every day. And a hafiz of the Qur'an should recite at least three paras, three ajza, three parts of the Qur'an every single day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq. That is the goal, that is the long-term end point. How do we get from where we are to where we should be? And of course, if a person reaches there and he can increase, that is from the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at minimum, the goal that we should set ourselves from this Ramadan to next Ramadan, that if I am a non-hafiz, minimum one para of the Qur'an I should develop within me. And remember, the Qur'an is such that it is not only about physically being able to read it, but you need the spiritual stamina to be able to read one para of the Qur'an. Or the spiritual stamina as a half is to read three paras of the Qur'an. And that spiritual stamina is only going to be built when you develop that relationship with the Qur'an and you cut off the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first step is for us to increase our recitation. We need to find time during the day, respected elders and brothers, to be able to develop that relationship with the Qur'an. The Hafiz of the Qur'an ulama mentioned that the majority of those three paras should be recited in salah at night in tahajjud. The majority should be recited in salah in tahajjud at night. Allah Ta'ala give us all the tawfiq. How far we are from that benchmark. Look at the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was nothing but Qur'an. Qur'an in the five daily salah. Lengthy qirat that was recited in the five daily salah. Then when he is resting, his head is on the lap of the Mubarak lap of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha reciting Qur'an. On the lap of one of the Sahaba reciting Qur'an. Waking up at night, two, three, four hours until his feet become swelled. Doing what? Swollen. Doing what? Reciting the Qur'an. Nabi Ali salam was totally immersed in the recitation of the Qur'an. And we find it difficult to recite sometimes one page a day, one quarter a day, one para a day. So the first thing is for us to develop this ability to recite the Qur'an. Our Hazrat Mala Yunus Patiya Sahib Rahmatullahi Alayhi gave an excellent prescription for those of whose 
Qur'an whose door has become a little weak. And he mentioned, and we can all take lesson from this, Huffaz and non-Huffaz alike, that in the morning before Fajr, recite three rukus, three rukus once. And immediately after Fajr, recite three rukus, the same three rukus. He mentions that this will take a person five or six minutes, especially for a half of the Qur'an. It's about three or four pages. The time of Zuhar, before Zuhar namaz, read the same three rukus, after Zuhar, the same three rukus. Carry on this pattern till the end of the day, till Isha time, and a person would have recited the same three rukus ten times for the day. Do this for six days. Do this for six days, and a person will cover one para of the Qur'an comfortably, allowing for a few uh, times when a person may be unwell, etc. But a person will cover one para by the end of the week. And then on Sunday, make door of this entire para so that you revise that which you have learned during the week. Hazrat mentions that if, if a person does this, then in, in a month's time he would have co- uh, completed four, uh, almost four paras of the Qur'an and in about seven months the revision of the entire Qur'an will be completed. And Hazrat Rahmatullahi Ali mentions that he has given this prescription to many huffaz whose Qur'an has become weak and they have found it to be extremely effective. Now we as non-Hufaz can also take lesson from this. Instead of reading the same ruku or the same three rukus over and over again, read different rukus. So by the end of the day, we would have re- recited almost an entire para of the Qur'an. Or if a person is not fluent with his recitation of the Qur'an, which is the case for many of us. Somebody mentioned to me the other, other day that you know it takes me an hour, sometimes an hour and 15 minutes to recite one para of the Qur'an. But at least that person is making effort. So I said to him that you need to bring that down with your fluency. At least bring it down to 25 minutes, 30 minutes. So read the same ruku or the same page like this, the hafiz and the non-hafiz. The non-hafiz when he reads it, he will be increasing his fluency throughout the entire day. So the first is the recitation of the Qur'an. The second is the correct pronunciation, the correct recitation of the Qur'an which we term tajweed. Every one of us needs to make sure that our recitation of the Mubarak Qur'an is done correctly. Find an avenue, find the hafiz of the Qur'an, spend a few minutes every day or even if it's every week, revising the recitation of the Qur'an. Many of us learn to recite the Qur'an in our young days when we did not have an opportunity to learn it with the correct tajweed and pronunciation. Let us make an effort in addition to the recitation of the Qur'an for us to be able to read it correctly. And the Qur'an is such that there is no end for anybody. That person can have completed all the different modes of Qirat. That person can be an excellent Hafiz and he can recite the Qur'an from cover to cover without a single mistake. He can then go on to recite the, the different volumes, thousands and thousands and thousands of tafasir, And he can read up on that. There's so much, it's a bottomless ocean. Every single individual, starting from that little child or that old person who can barely recite Alif Ba, right till the highest Mufassir, it's a bottomless ocean for each and every one of us. The Qur'an is open for every single person. So let us correct the, the, the recitation of Qur'an. And the third thing is for us to understand the meaning of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken such pain, such effort... This Qur'an was revealed from the Lohul Mahfuz, from the preserved tablet, onto the lowest sky. And from there, via the medium of the archangel, angel, the, the, the chief of all angels, Jibreel alayhi salam, coming down personally over a period of 23 years onto the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Such effort. And then from there, moving on through the Sahaba, through the Tabi'een, and all the preservation of the Qur'an and the Tafasir, etc. Such effort has been made to bring this Qur'an to us today. And we don't know what it means. So we should try, even if it is one ayah a week, get an authentic translation, an authentic tafsir, have and establish a connection with an authentic and an experienced alim, so that we are not doing this as a, as a self-study, because that is very dangerous. But let us understand the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending down to us. So three things at an individual level. One, our recitation. Let us increase that. Two, our pronunciation and our tajweed. Let us correct that. And three, the understanding of the message of the Qur'an. Let us begin to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to say to us. And then the second part, when it comes to our relationship with the Qur'an, is developing a love of Qur'an within our children. 
respected elders and brothers, there is no price tag that we can put upon creating a love of Qur'an amongst our children. We spend so much of money, time, effort, sacrifice for worldly benefits. We take them for so many different types of tuition. From a young age, we are taking them for sports coaching, cricket coaching, soccer coaching. Sometimes we start at two and three years of age so that when the child gets to a certain age, they are an expert in that particular sport. They will be able to make the national team and the provincial team and the, uh, the, the provincial colors, etc. How much of effort are we spending? How much of qurbani, how much of time and effort are we putting into creating a love of Qur'an within our children? And the first lap, the first madrasa is the lap of the mother. Sometimes we lack that confidence. We feel that, you know what, this Qur'an can only be taught by an experienced alim, by an experienced hafiz. But respected elders and brothers, each and every one of us has to, it is wajib upon us to learn how to read the Qur'an. And what better reason to learn how to read the Qur'an then so that we can teach our children. Let us start from a young age, encouraging them, Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha, uh, recognition of the, uh, the, the letters of the Qur'an. Sometimes we underestimate the intellectual ability of our small children. There are children out there that are fluently reciting the Qur'an at four and five years of age. They're memorizing the entire Qur'an at six and seven years of age. It is possible. They are sponges. But we have to make that effort and in addition to that, children are such that what they see their parents do, they will begin to imitate. When they see their parents glued for seven or eight hours a day to the screen, that little uh, one and a half year old also wants the screen, will also pretend to be on the phone. But when they see their parents reciting Quran, when they see their parents performing Salah, then you'll see that little child, although that little child can't even recognize that this is a Quran, this is a Kitab, this is a newspaper, but you'll see that child will pick up that book and he will pretend to move his lips as if he's reading Quran. You'll see that little child has never been to Maktab, but you will see the child making Allahu Akbar, trying to make sajda. Where do they learn this from? They see their parents and those around them. The environment of Quran, the environment of Salah is encouraging them to do that. So respected elders and brothers, our time has uh, expired. Let us make this firm intention that we will become people of the Qur'an. We will become the family of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we will focus at an individual level on three things. Number one, our recitation of the Qur'an, we will begin to increase it. One page, let's make it two pages. One quarter, make it a half a para. Half a para, make it three quarter. Three quarter, make it one para. And let us increase in that way. Secondly, we will correct our pronunciation and our tajweed. And we will find the avenues. And alhamdulillah, there are many avenues nowadays for adults even to correct the pronunciation Thirdly, we will begin to understand the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving to us. And lastly, we will encourage and create the environment of Qur'an from amongst our children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst His family, from amongst the people of the Qur'an. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.